In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Please be seated. Well, you no doubt noticed, but big changes are happening out front. I appreciate everybody's cooperation, working together with kind of shifting around to some different entrances for these next few weeks as we see some of this progress uh, take shape. The old concrete front porch is being removed in order to make way for the new. As you can see, if you look closely, it is no easy task to correct all the problems we had with the old porch. The concrete was badly pitted, cracked, uneven, and sloped in the wrong direction. In other words, running the water back towards the building instead of away from the building. In the North Country, with water that tends to freeze, that can create problems with such things as ice. As I thought about the sermon for this weekend, I started thinking about an analogy between that old porch and today's gospel reading. In our gospel reading, we heard about a man who was ill and whose life was seriously broken by a legion of demons. So, going back to our analogy, we had an old familiar porch that had serious problems and we knew it was not going to fix itself and certainly not without some serious intervention. What was broken and needed to be restored had gotten to the point where it was going to require no less than a mighty jackhammer with a great deal of force to break the old free so that the new, which we now greatly anticipate, could be put in place. We just heard about a man who was very ill, a person who could not fix himself, a man who was not at peace with God himself or others. It is to just such a man that Luke tells us that Jesus came. Now, notice that Jesus came and what he did. Jesus came and saw the person. Now, I want you to think about that. What does it mean that Jesus saw him? I'm guessing Jesus saw what everyone else saw. A man who was scary. A man whose life was out of control. A man probably not that much different than people we may see or encounter today. Maybe some of us even feel that way ourselves at times. But notice that Jesus was able to see the brokenness in the man as he really was. He didn't pretend otherwise. What he saw was a person whose life was being tormented and destroyed from within. But then, here's the big twist. Notice what Jesus saw that was different. Jesus saw through this man's present reality in order to see his potential to be a person who could know God and the ways of God. He didn't try to diminish God down to where this man was. He brought this man up to where God was calling him. A person who even in the midst of such chaos and tragedy had the potential. And that's what Jesus saw. Jesus saw that inside of this man that everyone saw terror and fear, the potential for this man to experience love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. My guess is if you took a poll of the Gerasene community, you would not have found those characteristics on the list of ways people would have described this man as he lurked among the tombs. And yet, the truth was, with God, this resided within him in his very soul, and his being. Now think about this too and how it affects us because Jesus shows us the way. When Jesus saw the man, he had choices. Jesus could have seen the man and pretended not to see him and just walked by, feeling justified for the other work that he knew lay before him. I mean, he certainly had a busy and demanding schedule. He could have seen the man and decided, well, you know, this poor man's out of control, hopeless, and simply walk the other way because that's somebody else's problem. And think about this one. He could have accepted the man as he was and simply list, limited his encounter to this experience with this man to being a gesture of kindness, offering him clothing, food, and shelter to help him get through another day. Certainly nothing wrong with any of those, right? In fact, we're commanded to do those very things. But think about this. If Jesus had stopped there, what was the possibility that he would have been risking enabling and enslaving this man 
to permanently, permanently live within his condition. It also would have been much easier on Jesus in some ways. Instead of the people come out and tell him, get out of here, we don't like what you're doing, and look what you've done to this, what was once a good herd of swine. The option might have been for simply for Jesus to get a few kudos for being a caring person, especially when you compare him to what other people in the community were doing. But this is where Jesus calls us and shows us what we're to do. Jesus rejected all of those options. And here's the hard part of that message from Jesus, which may make it difficult for us, because ironically, in the end, Jesus suffered the very rejection he refused to give to this person named Legion. So the path that Jesus chose was to see with the eyes of love, the eyes of true love, not an artificial love, not a self-deprecating love, but genuine love as God sees each of us. The eyes that could see this man living into the fullness of being the person God had created him to be. And so it becomes clear that Jesus saw more than we can see. Jesus saw a person. Jesus saw a human being through the eyes of love rather than the eyes of fear and judgment. By acknowledging the truth about what he was seeing in this man, it also put Jesus in a position to offer the man a way to have his life restored. Jesus loved this man enough to see him as he was, not to gloss around it, not to dance around it. And it was through that path that he was able to see this man demon-free. I sometimes wonder if mentioning words like demon or sin are going to get a negative reaction. But I want to tell you, we're commended to speak the truth in love, right? And here it is, right out of the Bible. This is the language of Jesus. We call ourselves Christians. Christian is to follow Jesus. Jesus tells us if we love him, we love his commandments, and these are his words, and this is his story. It's not something we're using pejoratively or casually. So the problem comes in how we apply these terms. Jesus came to the town where the man lived and saw that he was very ill. Jesus commanded that the unclean spirits come out of him and healed him. The people in the community had never seen the power of Jesus and certainly did not understand. But think about it for us. When we see the power of God at work in our midst or experience something we do not understand, we too may feel frightened or confused especially when facing something called demons. Set free from the demons, the man known as Legion found something he did not want to dare lose. Maybe you've experienced something like that in your life. I know I have. Those times when I've turned away from decisions and choices that could have taken me in a very bad direction or in the wrong direction. And I don't want to go back. It's done behind me. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The man was ready to be a loyal and devoted follower of Jesus. He wanted to stay close to the source of his healing, the source of his comfort. Talk about what it must have been like him for him to finally be accepted and loved. He did not want to go back to where he had been. He wanted to literally follow Jesus wherever he was going to remain in his shadow and in his light. Now, think about that going back to Jesus. That could have worked out quite well for Jesus. I mean, think about it. He'd had a convenient first-hand witness to show off his miracles and his healing powers. Look what I can do. And this option might have even gotten Jesus a few more kudos for what he had done for this poor man. But that's not the way of our Lord. Lord wants us to see us whole, standing on our feet, being the people we've been created by God to be. The gospel reading tells us that instead of parading the man about or adding a person to his cadre of devo devoted followers, Jesus simply told the man to go home and to stay among his people. Now, no doubt, this man was the talk of the town, a man everyone had given up on and wanted to avoid at all costs. 
God had delivered him and made him whole, something no one, not even his own family, thought was possible. It's probably very likely that everyone in the town knew him or knew of him, and yet it seems that no one knew him. Jesus delivered him from the demons that possessed him. And so what better witness to the power of God's capacity to heal any and all of us through Jesus Christ than this man? Jesus had a plan for the man's life, and the man responded. The man did not want to risk going back to that dark place where he had once been. Yet Jesus did not give in to this man's desire or fear to protect him from himself. And so he told him to stay at home among his people, the very people who had known him at his worst, those who had known him all those years. Why would Jesus do that to him? But Jesus knew his purpose was to become a living witness to the fullness of God's grace, mercy, and love as evidenced by a completely transformed life. Jesus wanted him to be a disciple, making disciples, sharing the good news of what he had experienced by simply turning his life over to Jesus. And the key for this man was to be faithful, and you all know these words well. Dear Lord, from this moment on, your will, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. And so it was, even if that meant staying home among those who had condemned him, who had hated him, who had feared him, who shunned him, who judged him, and whatever else he may have experienced. I can only imagine the depth of forgiveness that he encountered in the days following this miraculous healing. For him, he had to confront those who had known him at his worst. He had to seek the forgiveness of those he hurt during that terrible time in his life. Just think about the dominoes, the multitude, the rippling of healing and transformation that continued from this one miraculous healing throughout a whole community. Jesus knew what was before this man and left him where he needed to be for him to pass on the love and healing and forgiveness that he had received. Can you imagine the joy and peace this man discovered by following the path of Jesus, the path that Jesus had set for him? And when you think about it, it's such an easy and simple thing in some ways, and yet it's so challenging and difficult in others. And yet you sit there and think, but if you understood it, if you knew it, who would not want such a gift? And I think for many, sometimes the hardest step is that first step. Taking that first step can be huge. Taking that first step into the huge, beautiful, and intimidating path of life and love that God has set before each of us. So as you go through this week ahead, you don't want to go without any challenges or homework, right? So maybe you know someone who you see needs such a gift in their life. Take the risk. And keep asking, even if they say no, maybe in subtle ways, maybe in gentle ways. You know, there are all kinds of variety of ways of introducing people to Jesus. Bring them to worship or a class that might help them begin and grow in a relationship with Jesus. Maybe it begins over a cup of coffee or maybe over a beer at a tap room. You may be the one person who can share that important invitation someone desperately needs. And think about this. Jesus met this man and he meets each of us where we are. He did not condemn him, nor did he try to appease him, and he certainly didn't try to justify him or lock him into his place. Jesus stood by the man and gave him the opportunity to set his life free of the demons that had been in control. So I want to commend to you that that is the gift of love that's found in today's Gospel reading. And the challenge is that Jesus tells us to go and do likewise. Now, let's go back to our analogy with the porch. And no, this is not just an architect's imagination gone wild making this connection. It is a stretch, but not, well, maybe a little bit of a stretch. The restoration of the front porch serves as what I anticipate 
will be a beautiful metaphor for the intervention of an exorcism by Jesus. Okay, I'll give you a second to think on that one. A beautiful metaphor for the intervention of an exorcism by Jesus. And now think about it like this. When this intervention of construction is done and you walk across the new paving and through the new entrance, every time you come into this church and leave this church, think about that and take a moment and see it as a reminder of the hope for renewal that comes through Jesus no matter what your current obstacles to that peace and freedom might be. We come in hope, we leave in hope. In the introduction to his book, and by the way, you know, if you want a, any argument that really makes you question this whole postmodernism of we can name anything we want, anything we want at any time because it becomes what we name it rather than what it is. In the introduction to his book, Screwtape Letters, C.S. Lewis says that the devil is equally pleased by two very different mistakes that people make. The first mistake is to make too much of the devil as people did during the Inquisition, the witch trials, and I will say it sometimes, some very overzealous people trying to bring people to know Jesus uh, without letting Jesus lead the way. The second mistake is to make too little of him, as we tend to do today in many ways. I mean, think about it for you, or your friends or family or those around you at your work. Does the word evil seem kind of, well, not politically correct, maybe old-fashioned, maybe out of touch. I mean, come on, really? And yet, as you go through this week, I don't know how you can read a newspaper or watch the news or even walk, walk the streets of many places in this world without being reminded that evil is very much alive and well is with, and is with us today. I got to tell you, if you see the evil you can't help but give thanks for God because that is our only chance. There have always been and there is certainly no shortage of people today who try to synchronize or minimize the Christian faith seeing it as a way instead of being the way. I want to leave you with, think about this. The problem with that understanding is that it was not a higher power that saved this man's life from the demons that were destroying it. It was Jesus, the very real presence of God, fully human, fully God. Jesus did what Jesus alone can do. Now I want to remind you of a famous old neon sign in downtown Albany that simply says, Jesus saves to which all we can say is amen. May it be so. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.